uh, for me uh, as far as this school goes. So uh, there will be three lectures. So uh, the first one is this one, and then uh, the other two are here. So the lectures will really be basic, uh, which means if you have no prior knowledge to systems biology, because this is about systems biology, then you will be able to follow. Uh, now, uh, there are also working groups as well. Uh, you can see these uh, three working sessions here. Uh, the working sessions are also self-contained, although uh, it is sort of more advanced knowledge. Uh, so, uh, lecture one uh, today, uh, I'll make basically introduction to computational systems biology, and it will be uh, really, I think, basic, and I would also try to be brief because I, I guess you're tired. Uh, now, uh, lecture number two, it will be about uh, modeling uh, intercellular dynamics and regulation. And also, since uh, I should tell you something about uh, our research as well, so uh, this is one part of the research that we are doing. So uh, we are doing modeling of uh, regulation and dynamics inside cell. And within this, we are mostly working on bacterial immune systems, on CRISPR-Cas and restriction modification systems. And uh, I will give you some examples in subsequent lectures. Uh, but actually, why these systems are important? They're important for two reasons. So first reason is uh, their barrier to uh, what is known as horizontal transfer of genes. So uh, if you, for example, have genes which are uh, really bad for us and they can be good for bacteria, for example, genes which are related to virulence or uh, with antibiotic resistance, they will be transmitted through horizontal gene transfer. And then uh, these bacterial immune systems are preventing this, uh, at least in part. And then uh, the second reason, uh, so you may have heard for CRISPR-Cas, or perhaps you know it by CRISPR-Cas9. So this is this uh, sort of very new and very hot topic in biotechnology. Basic idea is that uh, it can edit any sequence in the genome that you want. So it can be used for basic biology. Uh, and potentially it might be used for medical purposes as well. And there are now a number of controversies related with CRISPR-Cas as well. For example, uh, designer babies, uh, ethical issues, and so on. Uh, so briefly, uh, this is what we are doing, although we are not really focusing on this biotechnological applications of CRISPR-Cas, at least not directly. What we are trying to understand is how this system is natively working in the cell. And then also by doing this, you can uh, make better ways to sort of use uh, use system in uh, biotechnology and medicine. Uh, so uh, this will be uh, the lecture two, and it will be really introduction. And now uh, working session number one uh, will also be on modeling intercellular dynamics, but it will be more the more advanced. So uh, what we'll what we'll co cover is sort of basic basics of nonlinear dynamics. Here, uh, in particular, be stability, uh, be stable switches. We will also talk about uh, bifurcations. So, uh, in the lecture, the example that I will give you, actually, there will be two examples, will be uh, when you have just one stationary state, which means systems goes from, say, zero to the stationary state. And what is important is this kinetics, how, it, how the system makes transition uh, to the stationary state. Now you can have, of course, more complex cases. For example, you can have two stationary state, then this is bistability. And importantly, topology of the stationary state can change. For example, when you change the system parameters. And uh, this is bifurcations. So this will be covered under uh, this working session one. And then uh, working session two will be about uh, biological oscillators, or so genetic oscillators, how you, however you want to call them. And uh, the reason why uh, Fernando mentioned that uh, uh, for working session two, you have to be on the working session one is because bifurcations are really needed in order to understand at least quantitatively how oscillators are working. Uh, so this is why these two working sessions are interrelated with each other. Although, for example, if you know, if you think that you know enough of the nonlinear dynamics, you can come as far as I'm concerned only to the working session two. Uh, now, lecture number three uh, will be about uh, modeling gene expression regulation. So regulation is really the key issue in systems biology. So up to now, uh, what you have heard is uh, uh, many interesting things about mainly about single biological molecules. Uh, for example, many, uh, many interesting properties of proteins. 
But then what is really important for systems biology is to understand uh, how, first of all, these molecules, different molecules come together, for example, proteins, DNA, RNA, how they interact, and how these interactions determine the property of the entire system. This is why it is called systems biology. Uh, and also, by the way, uh, this is why, uh, because, uh, I mean, uh, there are people with many different backgrounds here. So uh, in this first lecture, I will also give a brief introduction to basic molecular biology, uh, essentially focusing on regulation and on DNA and RNA, because you heard much about the protein, proteins already. Uh, and then uh, working session number three, it will be something different. Uh, so it will be on bioinformatics, which is uh, actually tightly related with systems biology. Uh, but it will be bioinformatics from the perspective of biophysics, uh, which means how we can use biophysical understanding uh, of different systems in order to improve the ways in which we analyze biological data. Uh, so that will be the working session three. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is sort of uh, the overview. Uh, and then uh, now is the overview of this first lecture. So uh, first I will be telling something about, uh, as I mentioned, basic uh, molecular biology. Uh, so uh, the focus will really be on regulation. And as an example of regulation, I will actually give regulation of transcription. Uh, so regulation of transcription is the most common point where uh, the things are regulated when you go from DNA uh, to the protein. Of course, as I will mention, you can have other types of regulation, but sort of as a model and as a focus, we will talk about regulation of transcription. Uh, now, uh, we'll have sort of general dis discussion, uh, brief general discussion, because it is an uh, introductory lecture of why uh, mathematical or quantitative modeling is needed in biology. Uh, and then uh, the last part of the lecture will be about uh, nonlinearity, why nonlinearity is, is uh, very essential in biological systems. And related with this, we'll talk about feedback loops, about cooperativity, to which this nonlinearity is, is very often uh, achieved, and uh, also about the lustre, uh, which uh, goes, uh, goes along with cooperativity often. Okay, so here's our way of basic molecular biology. Now, uh, you have already seen, I think, a few times uh, the central dogma of molecular biology. Uh, and actually, I will mention the central dogma a few times during this, this first lecture. Uh, so what central dogma really emphasizes is flow, flow of information. So it says that information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. So uh, first of all, uh, DNA can be duplicated in the process which is called replication. And when you think about the DNA, it's this very stable molecule, so you can view it uh, basically as a medium for storing information. Uh, then we have a transcription, which is process in which RNA is synthesized from DNA. And uh, RNA is a sort of intermediate between DNA and proteins, although it can have many other very interesting functions as well. Uh, it is typically short-lived, short so the half-life of proteins is on the order of minutes, as opposed to the proteins, which are typically uh, very stable in the cell. Their half-life is on the order of hours or even days. Uh, so uh, once we have RNA, then protein is synthesized to, uh, through the process called translation. And once we have proteins, uh, proteins are actually doing most of the work in the cell. Uh, they can catalyze chemical reactions as enzymes, they can have structural properties, they can serve as molecular motors, and so on. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the cycle dogma, and now uh, we are starting from the first player, from the DNA. So uh, in sort of first approximation, you can view DNA as a one-dimensional sequence of letters. So here you have a piece of DNA. And actually, this simple representation is... Uh, quite good for many purposes. For example, for bioinformatics. Let us let say that you want to find some motifs in this DNA sequence and so on. So all you need for this purpose is actually this 1D information. Now, of course, what we should keep in mind is that uh, DNA has a structure. And this structure, of course, can be very important. For example, you may want to bend your DNA. You may want to twist your DNA. DNA can be also melted meaning that the two strands of DNA can be separated and so on. And these processes 
can be very important as well. They can be important in modeling. They can be important in bioinformatics, uh, and so on. Uh, now, uh, I, I also mentioned replication. So I'll just what is just briefly shown here is that the replication works by having one of the two DNA strands as a template. And using this template, you're synthesizing uh, the other DNA strand. Now, uh, here, uh, before going to transcription, I should uh, briefly uh, mention or explain what is the structural genome. So here, you have a piece of genome. And then, uh, roughly, genome can be divided to genes. So genes are shown in blue here. And uh, they can be divided in intergenic, ge intergenic regions. So genes are pieces of DNA which code for proteins. So from gene, you get uh, your messenger RNA. Then uh, from messenger RNA, you, you, by translation, get proteins. And then uh, these pieces of DNA in between, uh, they are non-coding non regions of DNA. They do not code for proteins. But they can actually have a very important role. So, uh, and this role is uh, mostly in regulation of transcription. So you can have signals here which tell every gene when it should be turned on, turned on, when it should be transcribed, to what amount it should be transcribed, and where it should be transcribed. So, uh, for example, uh, if, if we look at our cells, right, the cells in our body, uh, if, if I look at my skin cell and, for example, at my brain cell, they are very different, obviously, but they have the same DNA. And what actually distinguishes the brain cell from the skin cell, for example, or any other cell, is actually regulation of gene expression. So different genes are turned on uh, in these different cells. And uh, this is actually determined by these uh, short signals, which are in these non-coding uh, parts of DNA. Uh, OK, uh, so then from gene, that is from uh, coding parts of DNA, uh, by the process of transcription, we get messenger RNA. And then uh, messenger RNA uh, gets folded. Uh, and this is called secondary structure of uh, messenger RNA. And this secondary structure is mostly, which is mostly what determines the properties of, of RNA. Uh, for example, uh, if, you, uh, if, you, uh, if you want to, to see how your RNA is uh, interacting with, for example, some protein, it is this shape of RNA that is its secondary structure, which is crucial. And actually, for those of you who are bio bioengineers, you might have heard the term optomer. So optomer is a short piece of RNA. And in Greek, optos means shape. Uh, so uh, what is meant by that is that interactions of RNA with other things in the cell are really determined by its sh shape, by its uh, by its secondary structure. So even as, as an approximation uh, to view RNA as a one-dimensional sequence of letter, it is not even, even good first approximation. And then, of course, RNA can have uh, the tertiary structure. For example, you can have quadruplex RNA and things like that. But, uh, you know, mostly it is the secondary structure which is most important for as far as RNA goes. And there are a number of methods in bioinformatics which predict uh, secondary structure of RNA. Now, uh, finally, uh, we come to, to translation in this central dogma. So uh, I do not have much to say about translation. So we start from the start codon. You end with uh, uh, stop codon. And then uh, you read uh, DNA as triplets, uh, which means that uh, uh, three bases at messenger RNA, they, de they determine uh, the amino acid uh, to which it will be translated. And then you get polypeptide sequence. This polypeptide sequence then gets folded into protein. And again, you have heard much about this already, so I will not go into that. OK. Uh, but now, as I mentioned, uh, what is really important for systems biology is regulation, and not only for systems biology, but for biology in general. And uh, sort of the most important point of regulation is transcription. And here is given a simple scheme of transcription. It applies to bacteria, but then conceptually it is sort of similar thing in eukaryotes as well. Uh, so what happens is that you have one large molecular motor. It's called RNA polymerase. 
And then uh, what happens is that RNA polymerase binds to DNA. When RNA polymerase is bound to DNA, then the two DNA strands get separated. And that is why I mentioned that it, even at basic level, structure of DNA can be important. For example, here we have melting on DNA, of melt, melting of DNA. The transcription will not start unless the two DNA strands are separated. Then once you separate the two DNA strands, uh, then transcription can initiate, uh, meaning that RNA polymerase uh, leaves the promoter, RNA starts to be synthesized, and uh, then you have RNA, and then we are back to the center dogma from RNA, you get uh, protein, and so on. So this is the basic process, but then this basic process is uh, very often regulated, and uh, it is regulated most often by proteins. These proteins are called transcription factors. And uh, what these transcription factors do is that they interact with the DNA. Uh, so in interaction is uh, by amino acids, which are uh, being, uh, which interact with, uh, with the DNA, with bases in DNA. And here's shown one single amino acid, uh, which is uh, making interaction with one nucleotide. Uh, so this is sort of on, on a small scale. And then on a larger scale, uh, this is one classical example of how regulation of transcription works. It is uh, so-called lac operon. And historically, uh, molecular biology sort of started with, uh, with, uh, with lac operon. Uh, so uh, what is shown in, in red here uh, is gene. Uh, and this gene uh, codes for enzyme. Uh, which degrades uh, sugar, uh, which is called lactose. Now, uh, as you have, as bacteria goes around, it, it, it must eat, so it is searching for food. Now, uh, the preferable food for bacteria is sugar called glucose, so whenever there is glucose around, the bacteria will eat glucose. But then if there is no glucose, bacteria gets hungry and it has to use other sugars. So one alternative sugar that uh, bacteria can eat is lactose. And this enzyme actually degrades lactose and it allows bacteria uh, to eat when lactose is present. Uh, but now this process is regulated. So, uh, for example, when lactose is absent, what happens is that uh, there is transcription factor, which in this case is receptor, so it is shown by, by this uh, green thing here. And then this receptor is active. It will be bound to DNA. Now, when receptor is bound to DNA, RNA polymerase cannot bind to DNA, and the gene will be off, meaning if you do not have lactose, there is no need to synthesize the enzyme which is degrading lactose, so you know, the gene will be off. Uh, there is another transcription factor here. It is shown in blue here, and it is acting as an activator of transcription. So uh, when the glucose is absent, meaning when the bacteria is hungry, uh, this transcription factor, this activator will be bound, and uh, what it is doing is that it is recruiting RNA polymerase to the promoter. So then you have RNA polymerase bound to the promoter, and then uh, the transcription, uh, the, the gene is being synthesized, the gene is off, it, the gene is on there. So in summary, uh, you will have the transcription only if the glucose is absent, meaning if bacteria is hungry, and if lactose is present, that is if it should be degraded, then uh, RNA polymerase will be bound to the promoter, transcription will start, and then appropriate gene, in this case protein, which is degrading lactose, uh, will be synthesized. So this is a nice, nice example about uh, control at the level of transcription. Uh, and what I should mention is that uh, this is on the level of single genes, but now imagine this one transcription factor, uh, this one gene, can regulate another gene, and then this another gene can regulate some other gene, and so on. And uh, by doing this, you really have a network. You have a network of, connect of genes which are connected with each other, and being connected means, in this case, being regulated by each other. And then by, by, uh, by having this, you, you have what is called, what people call gene networks or gene regulatory networks. For example, this is here is shown gene regulatory network for bacteria. Shrihia coli, which is standard bacterial model system. 
So uh, just briefly, uh, these circles here are, are genes, and then these arrows means regulation. So it's, if one gene is regulated by another, you have an arrow. arrow. If not, you do not have. OK. Uh, so this was sort of uh, introduction uh, in, in, in what we need as, as, as far as, as this lecture goes uh, in, in molecular biology. And now, uh, uh, since this is, this is introductory lecture, so uh, one question is uh, why we need uh, quantitative biology or why we need mathematical modeling in biology. So actually, uh, when we talk about models, uh, what I should mention is that uh, modeling is very much traditionally present in biology. It was always present. It was always there. Uh, and this is sort of a traditional uh, cycle of knowledge, so to say, in biology. Uh, you start from some hypothesis. Uh, and then, uh, starting from hypothesis, you do some experimental test. Uh, by doing experimental tests, you can, uh, well, the answer can be either positive or negative. So then you refine your hypothesis depending on the experimental test. And then it goes on and on. Uh, now, uh, what you should mention here, uh, so the model is present here. But first of all, uh, model is qualitative rather than quantitative. And then secondly, uh, there is no clear separation of work between uh, theory and experiment, which would be characteristic for physics. In other words, uh, experimentalist is uh, his own theorist at the same time. So he's the person who is both formulating the hypothesis and doing the experimental test. Uh, and actually, if you open any sort of molecular biology book, you will find a number of nice models there. For example, I was mentioning transcription, and uh, this is this is figure taken from one classical molecular biology te text, and it very nicely summarizes understanding of transcription. So what happens is that you have RNA polymerase. It is a large machinery. It moves along the DNA. It separates the two DNA strands, and RNA is being synthesized. So this is model. And uh, even more, you can make this model uh, uh, even more simple. So you can say that transcription works by having one of the two DNA strands serving as a template. And then by serving as a template, uh, you synthesize RNA to be complementary to one of these two DNA strands. Uh, and also the center dogma. I was, I mean, you heard about center dogma several times up to now. It is also a model. It is a model of how information flows. It tells you that information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. Although, as I will mention briefly, this model is actually uh, very much insufficient for systems biology. What is not present in this model is regulation or feedback loops. And feedback loops are really very important. So soon I will come to that. Okay. Now, uh, then what has changed? So I, I mentioned that very much always you had models in biology. But then uh, there is something what people call the revolution in molecular biology. And this revolution is that uh, uh, now, uh, uh, at some point, a uh, really large amount of data start, started to be accumulated. So if you look at gene bank, for example, today, you have uh, about 80,000 completely sequenced genomes. And uh, if you look at uh, lengths of these genomes, for example, if you look only at virus, it is about 50,000 base pairs long. If you look at the bacteria, it is two, two orders of magnitude longer. Uh, so typical bacteria genome is about 5 million base, base, base pairs. If you look at a single chromosome in, in human, it is order of magnitude longer uh, than bacterial genome. And there are uh, 23 chromosomes. So uh, you see that uh, the total length is about, again, two orders of magnitude larger than bacteria. So just to get some sense, if you would like to uh, write the bacterial genome in a book, uh, you would need a book which would be 1,000 pages long. And then if you would like to write human genome, uh, then you would need 1,000 of such 1,000 pages long books. So then it became obvious that you need uh, resources in order to uh, have repository of this information and to somehow syst syst make systematic this information. And this is what are now biological databases. Uh, 
And also, in addition to databases to just storing information, you, you need some way in order to make sense of this information. And for this, you really need mathematical methods. So you cannot just take, I don't know, five million base pairs. You cannot write, write them, stare at them, and, and, and say, you know, here are functional parts, here are non-functional. You need some way to process this information. And uh, in one word, uh, basically, this, uh, these methods for storing uh, this large amount of information and for analyzing this large amount of information, it's, it's called bioinformatics. So uh, nowadays, uh, bioinformatics is mostly done, lo I mean, logically by computer scientists, by statisticians, uh, very much. But actually, biophysics has a very important role in bioinformatics as well. And actually, if you look historically, bioinformatics, in fact, started from uh, sort of biophysics. Even now, uh, if you look at uh, uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, the appropriate section is called biophysics and computational biology. So uh, the reason is because uh, computational biology basically started from biophysics. Uh, which makes sense because in the beginning people are were thinking, uh, you know, how how physically, say RNA folds, how protein folds. They were thinking about interactions between proteins and DNA, in order to understand regulation and so on. Now, uh, with complexity of data, it also very much moved to, towards computer science and uh, towards statistics and so on. Uh, but as I mentioned, so. Uh, Bioinformatics can, biophysics has very important applications in, in bioinformatics uh, as well. So the basic idea is, is if, you have, if you can understand biophysically how some process, say, in the cell is happening, then you can improve uh, or make a new method which is uh, analyzing uh, the appropriate data. And uh, I'll, I'll talk more about specific examples in this uh, third working session. Okay, uh, now in addition to just having this large amount of sequence data, uh, another thing also became possible. And uh, this thing was to quantitatively measure essential expression of genes. So what is shown here is uh, DNA microarray. So basically each spot on DNA microarray, say, corresponds to one gene. And then intensity of these dots here, uh, they tell you about... Uh, to what level this gene is, is expressed in the cell. And this, this means that uh, to every gene, that is to every dot, you have one number associated. And you have really many genes. Uh, for example, even in bacteria, you have something like 5,000 genes. In eukaryotes, it's, 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 it's much more than that, and so on. Uh, so this means that on one hand, you have numbers. And then on the other hand, you, you must test your hypothesis. So you can really not, not compare numbers with words. You cannot compare numbers with qualitative uh, models or qualitative hypotheses. You, need, you must have quantitative models in order to compare numbers with numbers so that you can test hypotheses. And this is why, one reason why mathematical modeling became really very necessary. Uh, and I should also mention not only that you can measure expression of genes, but you can do it under different conditions. You can do it at different time points. You can now do it at the level of single cells, at the level of entire population, and so on. Uh, okay. Uh, so now with this, we come to sort of more uh, elaborate research, research cycle, uh, which is associated to so, sort of this revolution in molecular biology. Uh, so you start from theoretical model, and then this model is hopefully making falsifiable predictions. Then these predictions are being compared with experiment. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, you, you basically need to compare numbers by numbers. So the, the, the experiments are now quantitative measurements. Then depending on, 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 on the outcome of this comparison, you will modify the model. Uh, again, compare things and so on. And uh, now, so this shim uh, very much reminds to, this shim in, in modern biology very much reminds to physics. Uh, and uh, I should mention actually one more thing. Uh, and uh, this is related with, uh, with basically the second lecture uh, that, that I will go through tomorrow. Uh, so uh, in addition to having just quantitative measurements, what also happens is that uh, 
measuring dynamics at the level of cell, it's not easy, it's not trivial. It's much more hard to do uh, than measuring uh, dynamics in, uh, in, in microscopic world. So, so for example, if you need to, to measure, if policeman has to uh, measure the speed of the car, he can nowadays do this easily. But then measuring dynamics of molecules inside cell, it's, 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 not, tri it's not trivial at all, although it's, it's possible by, by mainly today by, by advances in uh, spectroscopic techniques. Uh, but then in, the, in addition to that, uh, the system which you are dealing is, is really complex, and it's complex in two ways. It, it employs a large number of components, large number of degrees of freedom. So I was talking about transcription factors and, as, and the regulations of one transcription factor is present in many copies. Uh, it can be from few transcription, copies of transcription factor in the cells to few thousands. And moreover, you do not have only single transcription factor, you, you have many of them in the cell. So which means system has many degrees of freedom and natural way to treat these many degrees of freedom is to use statistical mechanics or statistical thermodynamics. And then secondly, interactions are also highly nonlinear and uh, this will be basically uh, what the rest of, of, of my lecture today will be. Uh, why uh, this nonlinearity is really inherent uh, when you're looking, looking uh, at this, to the systems at the molecular scale. So uh, in addition to, to having quantitative measurements, then you also need a sort of advanced biophysical techniques in order to develop appropriate model. Uh, so they include statistical physics, nonlinear dynamics, stochastic modeling. I will not actually call it stochastic modeling uh, in the sense of, 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 uh, of systems biology during these lectures. Uh, but, uh, Okay, and, and I should mention one, one more thing. So uh, I, was, I was mentioning different techniques that you used, but actually very often the hardest thing when you are making a, a quantitative model is actually biology. So when you come to equations, this can be the easier part. But very often the most hard part is to first understand your system, to understand the experiment behind it, to get appropriate numbers. And uh, so uh, many people who, who physicists who are doing biology, they say that if you want to do biologists, you, you should really become biologists. And, and it, it, it also applies the other way around. So, for example, we have seen Chuck Farrakh here, who is biologist, biochemics, and, and well, uh, obviously he had to also come into physics very much. Okay, and, and with this, I will, I, will, I will conclude this sort of general part. And now, uh, the remaining thing will be why why nonlinearity is, is so important when you look, look at, at systems inside cell. Uh, so uh, again, I, this is the third time that I'm showing the central dogma. But what I mentioned is that uh, uh, the central dogma is insufficient for uh, systems biology. What is really essential are these feedback loops. So uh, I already gave you one example of the feedback loop. So this is regulation at the level of transcription. So proteins come, for example, transcription factor, and then they regulate this process of synthesizing RNA from DNA template. And this is not the only feedback loop that you, you can have. For example, you can have proteins regulating translation as well, for example, degrading RNA. Actually, I will give you one example uh, about this, I think, tomorrow. Uh, you, can, you can have RNA also regulating transcription. These are so-called small RNA or microRNA molecules, which are also very hot topic and so on. But these this feedback loops, they're really essential for, for systems biology. Uh, so uh, the point that I want to make is that even as a first approximation, uh, treating your system linearly uh, at, the, at the intercellular level is, is uh, in most, most of the cases, uh, <coughs> insufficient. And, and basically, why is that? So, uh, even if you look at the most elementary process, so we have molecule A, which is being bound by molecule B. So then we have this complex, AB. And there are many examples. For example, A can be transcription factor in this example that I showed you. B can be DNA. Then AB is a complex between transcription factor and DNA. Uh, or AB can be, for example, A can be some small molecule, for example, oxygen. B can be some receptor, for example, uh, 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 
hemoglobin. Uh, and, and then uh, AB can be ligand bound to this receptor. Or uh, in, in uh, A and B, for example, can be antibody and antigen, and they, they can make a complex. Uh, but this is sort of very fundamental process at the level of interaction of molecules inside the cell. Uh, so uh, when you have equilibrium, uh, this is the, dis the dissociation constant for this process. So you get dissociation constant by just <laughs> multiplying concentrations on the left-hand side and dividing this by the concentration on the right-hand side of the reaction. And then uh, let me say that our input, I'm sorry, here's a mistake, it should be A. So uh, our ligand is, concentration of our ligand is, is input. And then output uh, is how much of the receptor is being bound by the ligand. So it is fractional occupancy of the receptor by the ligand. So uh, here is uh, the number of receptors which are being bound by the ligand. And here is the total number of receptors. So this is our output, again, fractional occupancy of the receptor. And then uh, if, you, if you use this relationship for the dissociation constant, we get this input to output relationship. So again, A is our input. Uh, this is our output. And then if we plot this output versus input, fractional occupancy as a function of the ligand concentration, what, is, what we see is that even here at the most elementary level, this is a nonlinear curve. This is sigmoidal curve. And actually, this dissociation constant, it uh, defines uh, uh, the concentration of ligands at which the receptor is half saturated, meaning it's saturated 50% of the time. So, uh, for example, look at this red curve, it's, it's evidently nonlinear. Uh, and actually, not only that, uh, very often cooperativity uh, is important and comes in, in, in biological systems. And one ex classical example is hemoglobin. Actually, hemoglobin is a model system for a number of things. Uh, you already heard that it is a very nice model system and historically has been a very nice model system for protein structure. Then uh, it is a model system for interaction of ligand with receptor, where ligand is oxygen and the receptor is hemoglobin itself. This is the example that I will give. It is also a model for molecular model of disease. Uh, it is sickle cell anemia, and it is actually a disease when you, where you have mutation in the hemoglobin gene, uh, and which, which uh, makes the protein dysfunctional. And also importantly, it is a model for cooperativity and allostery. Uh, so uh, now, uh, what is meant by allostery? So uh, here on hemoglobin, you have four binding sites for oxygen. And what happens is uh, if only one oxygen molecule will be bound to hemoglobin, you will, uh, you will have a conformation change in the protein. And this conformation change will, will lead to the other three oxygen molecules uh, being able to bind much more easily. So essentially, as soon as one molecule will bind, the other three molecules of oxygen will also bind to hemoglobin. But notice this, so this is an ex example of cooperativity. But notice uh, in this example, this cooperativity does not happen through direct physical interactions. So these oxygen molecules, they do not physically interact with each other. But as soon as one binds, it will include the other three molecules. And there are also evidently other ways to achieve cooperativity. You can have also direct physical interactions between molecules. Uh, and, and I'll give examples later about that as well. Uh, but now, uh, let me look at the binding curves. So uh, what is shown on the vertical axis here is fractional occupancy of, uh, of hemoglobin in this case. And here on the horizontal axis uh, is given concentrations of ligand, uh, meaning oxygen. Actually, here, the pressure of, of oxygen is, is given, which is obviously directly related to the concentration of oxygen molecules. Now, uh, this is the binding curve for hemoglobin. But then, for comparison, uh, here is shown uh, myoglobin. So myoglobin uh, is sort of similar, uh, in a sense, to hemoglobin. But what happens is that myoglobin binds only one oxygen molecule. So in hemoglobin, you have four oxygen molecules which are being bound, and they are bound cooperatively, which means one molecule binds, and then the other three will be recluded. In myoglobin, it is only one molecule. And now, you can also view this, uh, this binding curve on a logarithmic scale. 
Uh, so just uh, compare this red curve corresponding to hemoglobin, that is to cooperative binding. And uh, look at this blue curve. This is myoglobin where you don't have cooperativity. But what would you say? What is the main difference between these two curves, the red one and the blue one? How, you how, we how would you describe it? OK, uh, shall I try? So uh, you see in hemoglobin, so first there is nothing. So the occupancy is 0. But then you have very rapid transition from this 0 to 1, meaning you have very rapid transition from off state to on state. And this is actually the basic property of cooperativity. Wherever you have cooperativity, you have this switch-like behavior, meaning system going from off, from 0, basically to 1. And if you compare it with myoglobin here, you do not have this switch-like behavior here. You have very gradual transition from 0 to 1. And now you can imagine, for example, uh, this red thing being, for example, toxic molecule in a cell. So if you have a toxic molecule, it can defend your cell from foreign DNA invasion. For example, this is what is exactly which is being done by Im immune systems. But then, of course, with toxic molecule, you, have, have, you can have autoimmunity as well. It can attack its own cell. So then, in this case, this red curve, it becomes, uh-huh, question. Uh, no, I, I mean, still, no, still the red curve is steeper here, so, I, I mean, uh, well, I'll, I'll show the equation on this, so it, it will be, it's Hill's curve, so evidently it is. Well, it's, you, you will see the equation in a moment, but it's just, it, it, you can see it more clearly from the red curve, but uh, I, I mean, it's, it, it just it makes the much uh, rapid transition. So it's the hill curve. So basically, uh, you can get it directly from here, right? So uh, in the case of hemoglobin, it's four here, right? In the case of myoglobin, it's one. So evidently, you know, you have much faster transition from off to on state. Uh, it's just that you can see it more clearly on the logarithmic scale. OK. Uh, Right, so uh, what I mentioned is that, uh, well, uh, if you imagine that this is a toxic molecule, so it can be very useful to have it off first, right, to have it at zero. Uh, in this way, you are giving time for antidote to protect uh, the whole cell so that you do not have autoimmunity. But then as soon as this happens, as soon as you have protected the whole cell, uh, you want your system to be turned on as soon as possible so that the, the cell can be protected. And uh, this, is, uh, this is this rapid transition of the system from off to on state. And this is actually the trademark of cooperativity. Wherever you have cooperativity present of the system, you will have this switch-like behavior. Rapid transition basically from zero uh, to one. And the larger the cooperativity will be, the more rapid this transition will happen. And uh, let me make this sort of more formal. So uh, B is our receptor again. And then we have N molecules of your ligand, which is being bound to your receptor. And you have a complex here. Again, you can write in equilibrium, you can write the dissociation constant for this reaction. Now, uh, the only change is that now you have A to the power of N here, because you again multiply concentrations of the left-hand side. And then if you do the same thing, so output is our fractional occupancy. And then uh, our input is uh, our ligand concentration. Uh, you get this input to output relationship. The crucial difference is that you have a Hill constant here. So this is this uh, power n. And this Hill constant is evidently related with cooperativity. More the, if the larger number of molecules comes together to bind, uh, the Hill constant will be large. And then if you plot it, uh, so now this is not logarithmic scale, scale right? So, so, I, so I think you can see it clearly here. So uh, if, you, if you plot it uh, 
this, this hill curve as you increase uh, the power of n. So you see here for n equals to 1, you have gradual transition from off to on state. Then it's more switch-like when you go to n equals to 2. But then, for example, for n equals to 4, you have very switch-like behavior. So it goes from 0 and then rapidly goes to, uh, goes to 1. OK. And uh, so uh, and, and evidently, the larger cooperativity you have, the more your system will be nonlinear. And actually, by this, I will, I will conclude this part. So uh, I, I hope I, I made the point that even at the most basic level, so if you have even single molecules interacting with each other, systems are, so to say, inherently uh, nonlinear. Uh, OK, and then uh, here is a problem, which is directly related with this hemoglobin to myoglobin data. Uh, so the data are real experimental data. They come from this paper. Uh, so uh, the problem, what I, what I would like you uh, uh, to do is the following. So take this data and then uh, just, uh, so the data is in the form of the Excel file. So uh, in one column, you have, uh, you have uh, oxygen pressure, meaning, meaning concentration of your ligand. And then in the other column, you have fractional occupancy. So uh, I want you to, to try to fit this skill curve uh, to the hemoglobin data. And uh, you will get, from this fit, you will get two coefficients. One is n, this skill constant, and the other is this dissociation constant. So this is one of the questions in the problem. So uh, for hemoglobin, uh, what value of the, of the Hill constant you, you expect to get from this fit? So remember, a Hill constant is how much molecules are binding together to the receptor. So in the case of hemoglobin, how many molecules we expect to have to bind together? Four, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so ideally it would be four, but actually I would like you to actually do the problem. So it, you will see it will not be ideal. It will not be actually four, but you will see what you will get. So it will be... Uh, the number which is smaller than four. Basically, this cooperativity is not, is not ideal. You, when one molecule binds, you will not have always all, all three other molecules being bound to the receptor. And then uh, you, should, you should do the, the, same, the same thing for myoglobin as well to compare things. Okay. Uh, and, and now, uh, so uh, I, I have enough time to, to conclude with the literature. Uh, so I wanted... To, uh, I wanted to provide uh, basically some overview of the literature which you may find useful as far as systems biology is concerned. Uh, so uh, here is the list of the general literature. Uh, and here is uh, like specific literature for, 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 for this lecture. I will not come back to this general literature. Uh, but in the next lecture, I will, uh, I will list sort of specific things uh, for each lecture. But now, uh, let me start with, with specific literature. So uh, this is one classical, uh, classical textbook in molecular bi biology. It is written by Alberts and other authors, so basically by, by a group of people from UC, UCF, UCSF, University of California at San Francisco. Uh, and it is really uh, basically a very nice introduction to, to molecular biology. And I'm also mentioning this because uh, of this first reference here. So this first reference is sort of paralog uh, of this molecular biology of the cell. It is called physical biology of the cell. Uh, it is very nicely written. Uh, it is also sort of a uh, uh, relatively long text, textbook. Uh, and uh, it is basically one of the most often used uh, textbooks as far as uh, molecular and cellular biophysics is concerned. Actually, by chance, we have collaboration now with one of the authors of the book. So there is this you know, Serbian Science Foundation, and we have grants with Diaspora. So Rianne Kondev is actually uh, Serbian. So, uh, uh, so, well, we have collaboration with, with, with one of the authors of the book. Uh, and then, uh, actually, uh, sort of more, more brief and more in some parts, more brief and more concise version of physical biology of the cell is this physics uh, in molecular biology. 
Uh, so advantage of this book is that uh, it is more briefly uh, written, but then on the other hand side, it is uh, sometimes it's more, more hard and uh, more hard to, to follow. Uh, also here you have uh, a standard text uh, uh, in, in systems biology. Now there is perhaps some redundancy in the title here. Uh, so uh, what you see here is mathematical modeling in systems biology. So I, I should mention uh, to a large extent systems biology uh, today uh, becomes essentially identical to mathematical biology of, I'm sorry, mathematical modeling of biological processes. There are also some experiments which are sort of associated with systems biology, but by most what systems biology is using is just ordinary experiments that biologists will normally do, say, biological lab next to you. Uh, and I should also mention it's not necessarily an introductory text. There is some, also some more advanced topics like stochastic modeling which are covered uh, in this text. So it is more like intermediate text. And uh, also, I was not, uh, well, it was not that relevant for this lecture, but it will be relevant for the next two working sessions. Uh, so uh, this is standard uh, textbook in nonlinear dynamics. It was written, I think, back, back in 1980s, but with many minor changes in the textbook, it, it is still uh, perhaps one of the most clear and uh, one of the most used uh, introduction to nonlinear dynamics. And also, as a last reference, so uh, some of this general discussion of, uh, of why quantitative modeling uh, may be useful in biology is also in this, in this review, review papers of, of, of ours. So uh, what I should mention in this folder that you have, uh, you will find the lecture itself, uh, you will find this data for the problem, and then finally you will find, uh, you will find uh, this review paper as well. Of course, I mean, I was not including the textbooks. You can find them in most of the libraries, so, okay. Okay, so thank you very much. That Uh -huh. Well, it's a comment about how close biology has come to physics, uh, to a real theory, predicting, and verifying. In physics, uh, Newton's theory of gravitation is such a theory. You can predict the positions of planets and so forth with restrictions. Of course, it may have sensitivity to initial conditions and even get to chaos. Mm -hmm. However, in biology, what you have is a self-organizing, open, evolving, dynamical system. Mm -hmm. And there is no mathematics that can handle that so far. That's my comment. Right, well, uh, yes, so, so, so actually we were having a discussion like this, uh, I think it was yesterday. So uh, I think someone was, was asking, for, for example, can you take the entire cell and then can you make the model of the entire cell? And then, uh, well, people are doing this nowadays as well. For example, for a minimal cell, you have, have complete models of sort of minimal cell and things like that. But then, uh, sort of, I mean, if you do things like that, if, if your model becomes as detailed as the entire system, then what is the point of the model? Uh, then you should better be doing experiment. So uh, what I would say is, is that uh, in systems biology, uh, the main purpose is actually to, to catch the main properties of your system, the properties which are most important for the phenomena that, that you want to describe. Uh, so uh, it's, not, it's not, I think, a goal in, in the sense of Newtonian mechanics to take the entire cell in its complexity and to entirely predict its behavior, but actually to extract what would be the most important for the system and what can explain the phenomena that, that you're looking yeah, at. What mathematics cannot do is deal with a system such that the evolution of the system changes the structure of the system. That's the crucial point. Right, but, but it, it, it depends on what time scales you're looking at. So if you're, if you're looking at evolution, so it is one long time scale. So it is how bacteria is changing, how it is acquiring genes, how it, they become resistant and so on. But say that you want to 
to, to, to model your system at, at, as it is at a given time. Yeah. Right, so, but, but... How some organism will grow as a living system, okay? Right, but, but just uh, what I want to say, it, it, it's, it's sort of two separate, sort of separate things. One is how they evolve, how they change. But the other thing is describing the system at a given, you know, as it is now, for example, E. coli as... as, as model and you can use statistics. I mean, genetic theory of gases is a model mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, using statistics and so forth that leads prediction of properties of gases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's not really uh, a direct, uh, I mean, a mathematical theory. That's, mm -hmm. that's the point that I'm trying to Okay. Uh, so any other? Uh huh. Can I use I'm sorry. If you can just, uh, if you can, it, just a little bit louder. Sorry. Yes, of course. So whenever you have cooperativity, you can do that. So, uh, well, actually, this would be this gene natural thing. For example, A can be one transcription factor. It can regulate gene B, and then B can regulate C. So, so essentially, whenever you have a cooperativity, you will have Hill function essentially there. Uh, but actually, there is nice mathematical way. It's, it's, it, it will actually be in the third lecture. So you use statistical thermodynamics. Uh, it goes to Basically, whenever you have some conformation of molecules, you can assign specific statistical weight to it. And then let me say that you want, sorry. Uh, then uh, let me say that you want to, to calculate probability of some configuration happening. You will, you will have your, your statistical weights of, of, of you know, uh, basically the configuration that you want. For example, transcriptionally active configuration divided by your partition functions, mean, meaning by statistical weights of the entire configuration. So, so in this way, this cooperativity of Hill function will naturally happen. But what I'm trying to say, you have a very concise sort of way in which you, which you, can, you can calculate these things. But, but yeah, so whenever you have cooperativity, this, this n, n factor will come up. Uh -huh. So whatever, to go back to the, the main, my domain and the domain data, uh -huh. the way I understand it is the thing you're looking for is that kind of threshold. So I'm sorry. Threshold, yes. Yeah, uh -huh. so you have some threshold below that concentration, then you have no binding, and over that you have pretty much like pretty quick binding. But then if you look at the mind moving, there's necessarily you know, right? If you look at that data, like, so okay. that's, that's the way I'm understanding. Yeah, yeah I'm, 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 I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. So, so perhaps I didn't explain it. Yeah, uh, so three, quick, three, yeah. Three, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's really very simple. So the threshold that you are mentioning, this is this KD. So KD is the threshold. So KD is concentration at which you will have half of your receptor being bound. So as, as you change KD, you will change this threshold, okay. And then the other thing is N. So N will be the slope here, right? The slope of this curve when A becomes KD. So, you know, the larger the N, the larger the slope will be. So it's as simple as that. So, you know, I mean... Uh, yeah, I, right, well, well, here it is a log of pressure. Yeah, so that's concentration. Right, yeah, well, literally it's not concentration, it's pressure, right, which is proportional to the concentration. It's oxygen, the gas, so just the ideal gas, I mean, law. Oh, doesn't really matter, but it, it is pressure which is plotted here, and the pressure is directly proportional to the concentration. Well, well, you have gas under ideal conditions, so you know, well. Right, so. 
concentration and pressure. So. It is just how they measured it actually in the experiment. So what is measured is pressure. Okay. And any more questions? Okay, so see you tomorrow then. Mm -hmm.